Hey everybody, it's me, Logan, here to help you with your final exam study guide. Whoops, I had this maximized, sorry about that. Um, I don't want to waste too much time giving the whole introduction, but this is basically just a Python final exam, so you kind of have to know Python, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about are rather... A lot of the things that are in this PDF I've already talked about before in my midterm video, so for the sake of everyone's time, I'm not going to repeat myself uh, as much as I can help it. <laughs> so I'm just going to link the midterm review video and you can just rewatch that. It's only like an hour and 20 minutes long, I think, which is like a decent chunk of time, but it's not like six hours or anything crazy. So you can just rewatch that for some of the parts and I'll tell you which parts are on that video versus what's in this video. So. Um, yeah. Now, with that out of the way, since we're not covering most of that, unless I have to correct myself on something that I said, which I will do in a few instances, um, that actually eliminates all of this here. Sorry, this. So, so everything above where I like this and above, it's all completely pointless. So I don't need to cover any of that. Not that it's pointless for the final. It's just I don't need to cover it myself because it's already in the midterm. So, um, all right. So let's go ahead and talk about some of this stuff. Like I did in the last video, we're just going to jump right into it. I'm not going to waste too much time here. So, um, okay, files, 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 files. All right. So there's two ways to read files in Python. Well, there's lots of ways, actually. But two ways that I'm going to talk about. Actually, three ways, technically. So, basically, um, there's... You can either use the read lines method from file objects, or you can traverse through the file objects, like line by line. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. So we have our, I made these two functions here. Hopefully it can help you visualize what I'm talking about so you can see it right in front of you. So we have our two functions here. So we have the file name, which is just a string. And I wanted to highlight that it's, it's just a string. It's not really like, you know, it's not a file object. This is just the name of the file, which is just a string. And this function, get file contents here, returns a list of strings. By the way, these little, this little like thing here and this thing here with the colon and this little arrow, this is called type hinting. Um, I'm not going to go over that in this video, although I would love to talk about it, but I, there's just not enough time. Uh, but I did talk about it in the, uh, I think I put it in the intermediate um guide the resource guide which is on the beginner guide that i linked to you guys as well so let me let me just oh wait this is the troubleshooting guide whoops i'm on the wrong guide <laughs> oopsie oopsie whoopsie i bet yeah a lot it's still very bare bones a lot of it's still a work in progress but i'll show you i'll show you real quick so right here uh sorry here uh type hinting i have a whole topic that goes over type hinting and i explained it all and and all that so and I showed why it's important to write documentation and everything. So, yeah, it's, a, you know, really great guides that I made for you guys. Um, and just in general, anyone that wants to learn Python, I put it, I'm going to put those in the link in the description as well. Just the beginner guide and because it links to the other two. So I don't need to link all three. But anyway, so we're not going to cover type hinting, though, just for the sake of time. I just wanted to bring that up in case you were confused what this notation is. But this doesn't actually change how Python actually executes it. It just... It's just for our understanding. But anyway, so the file name is just a string, right? So we want to make an actual file object because the file object is what we can use to read the file. So the way we do that is we use this open function in Python. And then from there, we will basically create a file object. Now, once we have the file object, file objects have their own methods. Uh, one of the methods that you can do to file objects is you can do the dot read lines and this whole block of code will actually return a list of strings. So let me show you the text file that we're actually gonna be looking at. So this is the text file. So it has two lines in it. So basically it would look like this. Let me show you guys. So file lines would be equal to a list of strings that looks roughly like this. One second. And then I'll verify this with debugging. Oh, I do want to talk about debugging in this video, even though I've covered it before uh, in other videos, but I didn't get to cover it in the midterm. And I was like so 
annoyed that I didn't have time to cover debugging because I really wanted to. So I'm going to cover it in this class, uh, or in this video, rather. So, and if you don't remember anything from this class, at least remember debugging, please, if you can. It's pretty helpful, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, so this basically returns this, essentially. This is a list of strings where each string is a line. And the way it knows how to separate this into two different strings is by the new line character. That's what the read lines means, because it's like line by line. And how does a text file know when you're done writing that line? Well, it's when you hit the enter key. I mean, you could have like word wrap on and stuff, but it won't actually create a new line until you physically press the enter key. So anyway, so that's what read lines does. That's one way that you can do it. So basically all this function is doing, as you can see, is we're passing in the file name once they actually call the function. And then it opens that file in read mode. That's what the R is here. So we're opening the file in read mode, and this will return a file object. Remember, the object is different from the file name. The file name is just a string, but the file object is like its own thing. It's like a whole different kind of data type, so just keep that in mind. So anyway, so it's, we're opening the file, we're reading all the lines all in one single line, and then this is now all the lines of our file in a list of strings, and then we're closing our file, and then we're returning. So now the return we'll return back to wherever we called the function at and it will uh, set our function call equal to that list of strings. So now, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, about returning and stuff, just watch my midterm video. I talked about functions and returning and what returning does and all that. So, you know, either way. Okay. God, I would hope if you're about to take a final exam in Python, I would hope you understand returns by now. Jeez. Oh, you're in for a nightmare if you're, if you, <laughs> if you, don't know but anyway okay so there's there's another way that you can get the contents of a file you can traverse through it and so file objects are what's known as iterable objects in python which means that we can iterate through it iteration by iteration so step one step two step three step four and so on so this is basically like this well you can ignore the empty list line essentially but this is basically doing the exact same thing we're, we're opening the file again we're making a file object um, we're going to make an empty list and I'll explain why that's important here in like literally two seconds. So now we're iterating through the file line by line. Now, special note again about this word here. I could have used any word I want here. I could have used like I, I could have used S, doesn't matter as long as I'm consistent with it. But I chose to use the word line here because that kind of is what it is. Like it's, it, it represents every single line in the text file. So it's like, that's exactly what it is. So it's a good variable name, in my opinion. Um, by the way, I normally, if I was writing code, I probably wouldn't use the word file object. I would probably just write this as file, but I chose to use file object because I want it to be a little bit more clear what it is. Cause it's not ex like, I can't, I mean, file is good and that's pretty descriptive, but I, I see sometimes people put variables it's like file is equal like they would say like for example instead of text file name they'd be like file is equal to that and it's like well i mean that's just the name of the file that doesn't like this isn't the actual object of the file like this is just the name of the file so it's really not file is not technically a good name it'd be better if it was like file name or i mean even that's kind of generic you'd want to say what kind of file this is like you know like if this is your data file name or something like this represents all the data that you've collected or like a, maybe it's a log file so it's like this is your log file name i don't know just you know for the sake of better variable names but anyway i'm gonna undo all my crap because i think text file name was perfectly fine so okay anyway so we're iterating through the file and what we're doing here is i've created an empty list that we're going to fill up with each of the lines so that it kind of does the same thing so that these functions are pretty much identical so basically we're just appending the list with lines. I guess we haven't talked about list yet. I probably should have talked about that first because <laughs> I don't think I talked about lists in my midterm review video. I don't think they were on there yet. Um, but we'll talk about that next. That'll be like the next thing that we talk about, I guess. Um, okay. All right. Okie dokie. So we're appending the list and then we're closing the file again and then we are returning the list that we made by the end of the iteration. And I know that that return is going to happen after the loop because it's on the same indentation here as the uh as the uh four line sorry it's been a long day 
Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Now we can also write to the file and to do that, you could just say, I'm just gonna do it in the global namespace here just for the sake of time. But you could just say like, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna overwrite my file and I'm just gonna say string to write is equal to, this is the new line of my no, new and only line of my text file now. And now I could say, let's see, text file is equal to open, whoops, text file name. We'll just go ahead and use our variable that we made there. We're going to open it in write mode. And also you can open it in a, which is append, and that would only write this line at the end of whatever is already in the file. So it won't mess with anything in the file. It'll just add to the bottom of it, essentially. But we're going to overwrite everything in the file. Uh, I'm not actually going to execute this, but I'll just show you how it would be done. And then, so now we can just say text file dot write. See, it shows up there in our type hinting. Now this is a method. Now the underscore underscore s, that parameter wants us to pass in a string and that string is gonna be what we're actually gonna write to the file. So I'm gonna use my variable here, string to write. And if I executed this line in Python, like all well, the whole thing really, it would actually write the text file and this would only be the only line that we see. Like, oh, well, I guess I must just <laughs> ran it or something, but anyway, yeah. So now it's the only line of my file. You can see that there. And then I would just have to say text file dot close. And then there you go. See, easy peasy. Okay, so the reason we have to close the file, by the way, is just like so that Python can free up the resources and all that. So it's kind of like memory leaks if you know about that concept. So, but I won't go too, too deep into that because that gets into like some really big computer science stuff, so. But that's essentially how you work with files. Um, let's see if there's anything I missed. Open, read, write, traverse by line, close. Yep, okay, we covered everything. There is actually one more final thing. So you can what, use what's known as a context manager to manage your files. And this is the more, more standard practice, more professional way that people usually use file input operations or output or whatever. So you could say with open text file name, and let's just do it in read mode again. Let's kind of do what this function was doing. So I could have said, let me show you. Actually, let me just copy this function because, oops, I didn't want to cut it. I just wanted to copy it. Okay, now we're going to open it in a slightly different way. So we're going to say with open file name r. Oh, wait, sorry. As text file. My bad. Then we are going to actually we're going to name it file object so that it's meshes more with our function. Now I just I can remove the close. We want to put that there and then that's all we need. And so this basically does the exact same thing. So essentially, actually, I can move my return. I just realized that. Whoops. Sorry. It doesn't matter. It's not like a loops. It's not going to stop on the first iteration. This only does one thing. Like it's going to grab all the stuff and then it, it can just return it. So anyway, but the beauty of using a context manager, the reason this is important is that I don't have to close the file now because it will actually automatically get closed for me. That's the whole reason I use a context manager is that it manages all that stuff for me. And this becomes especially important, not just for text files, but other kinds of things when you use context managers for it. Um, it's just really nice to ha to like, cause you know, humans are, we make mistakes and we can forget to close things and stuff. So especially this is like, let me just be honest with you guys. Closing files is not as big of a deal for like quick little Python scripts that just run and execute and stop and whatever. But when you have Python scripts that run 24 seven, like for those of you who write programs that uh, are like websites or something with 24 seven run times, and which pretty much literally is every website nowadays and um like things like discord bots and anything that runs in the cloud basically so pretty much most of what you program is going to be constantly running um 
when you write stuff like that, this kind of stuff matters because every time it has to go open that file, if it never closes it, it can cause some really weird bugs and you don't want to get that. So that's why context managers are really, really important when you get into like professional coding and stuff. But, you know, for this class, you don't have to know them. In fact, I don't want you to memorize this for the final because it won't be on the final. You don't have to know the with open thing, but just something to make a note of. Maybe come back to this video after you've taken the class, you know, after you've already passed the exam. Hopefully, you know, you can just come back to this video and just, you know, really take the time to dive deep into the stuff so that you can really learn good Python practices. But anyway, OK, let's move on. I don't want to spend too much time talking about files. Um, we're already 15 minutes in. We've only talked about files. Okay, we're going to talk about lists now. Um, so lists, right. So lists, where should I start with lists? Okay. So with lists, lists can store any kind of data type, essentially. Like you can say my example list is equal to a string of high and then the number one and then a bool variable which is like true and then like a 2.0 like i don't they don't all have to be the same thing like i could just do like a list that's like one two three four or whatever and that's fine but they could be other things and not only that let me show you guys something really cool that you might not know about and this won't be on the final also but i want to show you this because it's so cool and you will use this a lot so actually i think it is on one of your discussion posts so you will use this this well i'm just gonna shut up okay so let's import turtle real quick you don't have to know turtle for the final but i want to show you this so let's import turtle so if i make a bunch of turtle objects like let's say i say for i in range five i'm gonna make five turtle objects i could say uh let's just say let's make a list and let's say list of turtles or let's just say turtle list let's make it empty because we're going to add into it so now we're going to say uh sorry my brain blanked for a minute we are going to say turtle list dot append and then we can initiate a turtle object and so now we could say turtle dot turtle and now we have just made five turtle objects that will like i haven't executed this yet but oh well there it goes see it's executing it as i'm typing it but yeah so essentially um it would basically make five turtle objects and it would like you would have a list of turtle objects so anyway what i'm trying to say is lists can have more things than just like the typical data types like you can have a list of lists and inside the second list like you'd have like a 2D list, like it would look like this. It would be like two dimensional list. You could, whoops, that's not a list. <laughs> you could have a list of lists and you could say one, two, and then the second list is gonna be, I don't know, three, four, and so on. And then you don't have to know this for the final, but I wanna just cover that. So anyway, I'm gonna remove my turtle code because it's bugging VS code out. I guess VS code is just executing everything I'm typing for some reason, and I don't know what's up with that. That must be a setting or something I enabled. That's not good. Uh, I'll look at that later. If any of you guys know what I'm talking about, maybe you can help me out there. I don't know. I've never seen it do that until now. It's funny. Anyway, okay. But yeah, lists can have other things in them. Like, lists can have pretty much anything in them is what I'm trying to say. That's all I want you to care about. You don't have to worry about all that. Just know that lists can have anything in them, including other lists, basically. Um, they can have custom objects, like your fighter objects that you made for homework 10, stuff like that. You can make a custom object, and then you can, like, whatever your classes are, you can initiate an object, and then you can put it in the list, basically. And then you could reference that, and then you, then you could modify just that specific object. Like, how I had my list of turtles, I could go in turtle by turtle. <laughs> That's a funny thing to say. Turtle by turtle on the, like through the list, like with a for loop or something. And then I could say, okay, on the first iteration, I want you to make the first turtle like green. And then on the second iteration, when we're on the second turtle in the list, I want you to make their color like red or something. And so I could do that. And then it will change each turtle object. So you could do that for all kinds of things. Anyway, just really cool. Really fascinating. I find it really, really fun to, to know that stuff. Okay. But yeah, lists. Okay. So lists. Lists are mutable. Um, I guess we need to talk about mutable versus immutable. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess there's really no way to talk about lists without talking about mutable stuff. So, okay, we're like I said, this gonna this video is gonna be a little weird. We're gonna kind of skip around a little bit, but I have to talk about mutable versus immutable. Otherwise, everything I'm about to say just won't make sense. So, basically, a mutable object in Python means that its data can be modified. An object that is immutable cannot be modified, but it can be reassigned. So you can, re like, so for example, a string. A string is mutable. So you could say, like, just also close out these terminals now while I'm at it. Okay, so you could say like example string is equal to word, right? And then I could say example string dot upper. Now here's the thing. The upper method changes all the letters in the word to uppercase, like in the string specifically, which in this case is the word word, but you know. But here's the thing. This line of code on its own doesn't do anything if I don't do anything with this line like this isn't going to magically like if i printed this right now it would not print capital word it would just print the same string and that's because strings are immutable which means they can't be changed this way but what we could do is we could redefine the string to be equal to the uppercase version of itself now that works because remember this block of code returns a modified copy, but it didn't modify the original. All it's doing is it's taking the data and it's like adding that data into like a copy variable and then it's modifying the copy variable. And then if you set that equal to something, then like if you're setting the original thing equal to the modified copy, well now the original is the modified copy is basically what we just did. But lists on the other hand, lists are not immutable lists are immutable data types so if i did this for example let's say i wanted to sort my list which uh, i guess i should make a better list let's just say unsorted list is going to be equal to i don't know zero five two four something like that so now this is an unsorted list so it should be zero two four five so i could just do this i could just say unsorted list dot sort there we go. And now if I tried to print my unsorted list, it would actually print correctly. And let's go ahead and do that. So it might print some other stuff. I don't know what all I was printing in this, but yeah, there we go. See, so it printed the sorted list correctly. Woohoo. But that wouldn't work for strings. In fact, I can go ahead and show you that again. So just to show you real quick, it's so like example string is equal to word i probably shouldn't have gotten rid of that code uh example string dot upper and then print example string okay so it's going to print the list thing again but that's fine okay see word is still lowercase when it printed it even though that changed it right nope it didn't change it but if we actually set it equal to itself that it equal to the modified version of itself then it will change it. Now we should see the sorted list and then we should see word in all caps here. See? So that's all you need to know about mutable versus immutable. It just means that you can't just do lines like this by itself if it's immutable. And I don't want you guys to feel too like confused by this because I actually have a whole section on this in the resource guide that I linked for you guys. and. I cover which data types are mutable versus not mutable. At least I believe I did. I think I did. I know I did in the data type section. So at the very least I can, I mean, all these links probably cover it too, but, um, okay. Well, I know I covered it here. Sorry. <laughs> I hate to tell you guys the wrong thing. I did cover it here. I said, uh, note the whoops. Yeah, here we go. The following data types are immutable. See? And, you know, the following data types are immutable and all that. Like I said, listen, I know it's hard to see because it's kind of like cut off, but it said listen dictionaries are immutable. And then like these data types right here to here are immutable. I'm pretty sure Booleans are immutable uh, by design. I feel like they have to be. I don't think they're, I'm pretty sure they're immutable. I, or 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're immutable. I don't know that one for sure. I think it was in the dock somewhere. I don't know. Not that big of a deal. You don't really work with Booleans that much in terms of modifying them. Other than just flipping them back and forth. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. That is, I mean, that's basically all I wanted to say. There is actually one more thing I have to say about lists, though, uh, as far as that goes. So I'm not going to talk about mutable versus immutable anymore. But I am going to say there's other methods of list that could be pretty helpful here. Whoops. Let me not get rid of my print statement. In fact, let me just get rid of this. Okay. So there's other list methods that we can do. Let me show you that. So in our doc uh, here that I made, so we can go here to lists. Um, let's look at all the list methods that we can do. So here we go. So there's append, which will add an item to the end of a list. That's really handy. So if I wanted to make this last item, like instead of a, I mean, it wouldn't replace it, but like if I wanted to make this 0, 5, 2, 4, 3 or something, I could just do dot append 3. Now there's also confusingly a dot extend, unsorted list dot extend, which kind of does the same thing, except there's a key difference. Extend needs an iterable type. So I would have to say three, or I would have to say three comma six or something. Because notice these brackets here, it might be hard to see, but this is a list right here. You have to pass in some kind of iterable object. So you're basically saying take list one and take the stuff from list two and just shove it into the end of list one. But here's the thing, just remember this, because I made this mistake personally. I completely forgot about this and I goofed. And one time I was coding, like literally recently, like I think it was like within three, two or three months ago, I think it was, it was pretty recent because I just completely forgot about this. But list extend doesn't return a new list. It just modifies the original. So you can't say like new list is equal to this because no that won't work because new list will be none because this method like this whole block of code here returns none because what it actually did was it added the three and six to the end of this list so i would have to print the unsorted list like i did here or you know whatever like i don't have to make a variable for this and that goes into the mutable versus immutable thing because data types that are mutable usually their methods return none because they modified the original. They don't need to return a copy of it. They already modified the original. Whereas immutables like strings, for example, their methods, like as we, like as we saw with the dot upper, it did return a, a modified version of it because it's immutable. So anyway, okay. All right. So, but I won't go over all the list methods because you can see it right here. If you want to know where this is in the doc, it's uh, if you scroll, if you open up this little side panel and you scroll all the way down, to our list section it's in the docs and articles and it's this link right here um, and this one just covers lists in general but this one right here is specifically all the little like methods that you can do with lists um, okay all right i'm not going to go over all the list methods though i'm, I'm going to trust you to read the doc i'll link the doc in the description i don't have time to cover all of it unfortunately there's just not enough time i'm already 30 minutes into this video we only talked about like two bullet points so Whew, moving on for the sake of time. Actually, we talked about three. Anyway, moving on for the sake of time. So we do need to talk about slicing, though. Um, I'm going to cover this really quick. So we're going to cover indexing and slicing, and that is on the doc here, uh, not to get you guys too mixed up. It is the next thing. So every I'm going to talk about it for lists, but note everything that I say here is going to also apply to strings. So just treat these two as the same in your mind for right now, even though they're not really the same. But treat them as the same because all the slicing stuff and indexing, all of that is exactly the same for both of them pretty much. Okay, so say I want to get the first item in this list. Let's make this not a zero because I think that makes it a little more confusing as to what I'm doing. So let's say I want to get the first item in this list and I want to print it out to the console. So let's go ahead and reference our variable because I know I'm going to need that variable. So the way I get the first item is I can do an index and I can say zero because indexes will start at zero. So our index, we have four items in this list. So the value range for our index is, I'll make a new index list here. So our value range is this. I can use any number in this list. Let's just call it, let's make this a variable. Let's call it index range. There we go. See, 
So this is, a, I mean, I know it kind of looks the same, but this is a separate thing. But this is the values that I can use for this index because it's always zero to however many items are in the list minus one. So you could say index minimum is equal to zero and index max is going to be equal to the length of whatever the data type is minus one. That's a good way to kind of remember it. So this is our uh, minimum and this is our maximum. And because it says four items, well, four minus one, that's three. I passed kindergarten. So there you go. So that's how I got that number. Okay. So this is how you index an item. So this block of code right here would return one. Well, it wouldn't return anything because I'm printing it. So actually this block of code returns none technically, but this would print one to the console and I can run that and I can show you. So there you go. See one right there. Now, what if I want to get the last item? Well, I, like I said, I could just do three because I know that it's going to be like that. Or I could just, I could use that variable that I made and I could say index max. I could do that if I wanted to. I mean, that's perfectly valid. But typically what you see people doing, which four was the last item, of course. But um, typically what you see people doing, though, is they don't use index max. They'll typically just do negative one because we can also do negative indexing. Negative indexing is basically exactly the same as normal indexing, except you put a negative sign and negative indexes start at one instead of zero. So you just have to increase the number by one. So whatever your normal index was, in this case, it was a zero for the first item. Like, let's say I want to get the first, well, actually, sorry. Uh, I wanted to get the last item. Sorry, that's what I was doing. So to get the last item, we start the index at negative one. So we just shift our index values and then we just add one to them and then like make it a negative. So our index started here. So this is our positive indexes. So we're gonna say negative index range is gonna be equal to negative one, negative two, negative three, and negative four. And I know that because all I really did was I just added one to all of these and then put a negative sign in there. But it's actually the other way around because in the specific order to match these up, it would actually be like this because negative four would actually get me one in the list. Whoops. So this is kind of confusing because one and four are our last numbers here. So I probably should have made these like strings or something to be a little more clear as to what I'm talking about. But this block of code will return this number. And so if I print that, it should print that to the console. So we should see one right here from this print statement to the console. And we did. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. That's how, like, I just want to show you visually what I'm talking about. So these are the range of numbers you can use for positive indexes for like whatever your length is minus one. And then basically you just take that and flip the list, like reverse it, and then just add one to each item and then multiply all of them by negative one. So you could actually do that as a mathematical operation if you wanted to visualize it yourself. You don't need to do all this nonsense right here. This is just to help you visualize it, but I just wanted to show you that. So anyway, that's how you index stuff. Uh, now there's also slicing. So let's say I only wanna get the second number in the list and everything after that. So the way I would do that is remember, that index is start at zero. So the second item in the list is actually at index position one. So let's go ahead and put our one in there. I know I'm gonna need that somewhere. So what we can do is we can actually just put a colon right after this, and this will give us five, two, four, I believe, unless I'm stupid and don't know how slicing works. Ah, yes. Now remember that this will actually return another list. So this doesn't just print five, two, four to the console like how we saw with one. If you do a colon anywhere in this, you're actually slicing. And the way slicing works is, forget about coding for a minute. Let's just forget about Python. Forget about coding, forget about programming. Blah, get that out of here. I want you to think about a pie. If I have a pie, like a circular pie, and I cut a piece of that pie, like a slice of that pie, if I hold this up and I walked into another room and gave this to someone who doesn't know there's a whole pie in there, if I gave this to someone, and they thought that this was the only, like maybe I just bought this at a dollar store or something. Maybe not a dollar store, but like some grocery store. But like if I bought this slice of pie in like a box and it was just this pie, they would say, hey, that's pie. They wouldn't say, hey, that's a slice of pie, even though it technically is what it was. Um, so you can think of it similarly, like if I slice a list, well, that's also going to be a list. 
So when you slice a list, it actually returns another list. But anyway, so if you put the colon after the number, what you're actually saying is, I want you to get everything from the number all the way to the end of the list. If you put the colon before the number, this would only get me the one, which I probably, again, I probably should have used a different number. Let's just use three or something. So this would only give me three, and it would only print three to the console. The thing is, the thing you need to realize, and actually, let's go ahead and verify that so I'm not telling you guys the wrong thing. But yeah, see, there we go. And it gave me a list of three. It didn't just give me the three itself. It gave me a list of three because, again, the slicing thing. But the thing I want you to realize and what I want you to recognize from that was, remember... When we sliced from the other way, getting everything after that, it included the number that we talked about. But see here, I gave it the one, so this was the five number. So I gave it that, but it didn't include the five. Well, that's because when you slice the other way from the front to whatever the number is, you're not actually including the number in that. So if I wanted to just get three and five, I would actually have to do one more index after that. So I would have to say two and then then it would give me three and five. See, that's it. That's all slicing is. It's so easy. It's just, in my opinion, honestly, like I don't do enough slicing to have this fully memorized. I kind of had to like reteach myself for this exam video. Um, but it is really helpful, especially when you get into like algorithms and data structures and leak code questions and stuff. You really need to know slicing because it'll save you a lot of time. But um, and if you ever do any scientific coding, like NumPy arrays and Panda data frames and stuff, like you really should learn slicing. It's really helpful. But uh, anyway, the, I think where slicing gets really confusing is knowing where to put the colon. Like, does the colon go before or after? Like, uh, So I would recommend maybe like making a very small example like this to yourself and testing it before you try to implement it on like big scale code. That way you know for sure what you're actually slicing. Um, but just my own advice there. I mean, I recommend that for literally everything in Python. Try to, try to, but try to make like a test example and and whittle it down to like the smallest possible version of whatever concept you're trying to execute. And then once you get the small concepts down, then try to wrap it all together and and you know scale it up essentially. Okay, we're done talking about lists now because I'm not going to cover all the list methods because that's in the doc. And I'm not going to cover anything more about slicing or indexing. We've already covered pretty much everything. Um, traversing is literally the same as traversing through anything else. You just, it's like for I in range, whatever, you know. Or like for I in range length, whatever, that's traversing by index. And then for I, or for element and list, you're traversing by element. There's also enumerating. I didn't show you guys that. I showed some of you guys that. But you can also enumerate. So you could also say like for index and element in unsorted list. Actually, sorry. In enumerate. Whoops. Unsorted list. Then print the index and the element, essentially. So now it would print both. So if I did do that, it would say uh, well, it's going to print the slice, but yeah, so this was the index and the first item was three. This was the first, the second index, which is one and the second item, which is five and all that. So that's enumerating, by the way, I didn't show you that in the midterm video. You don't need to know that for the final. I just thought that was cool. Um, anyway, okay. All right. I'm going to cover enumerating a little bit more when we talk about dictionaries, though. So, which is basically now. So we're now we're going to talk about dictionaries. So dictionaries. Dictionaries, dictionaries. Where do I begin with dictionaries? Oh, there's a lot to talk about with dictionaries. Okay. The first thing you need to know about dictionaries is, remember how we talked about mutable versus immutable stuff? Well, dictionaries have a little bit of stuff you need to know about that because the keys in dictionaries can only be immutable. And dictionaries themselves, the whole dictionary, is what's known as a mutable object, like lists. Now, key, uh, dictionaries are mapping data types in Python, and that doesn't matter for you guys to know, but essentially, dictionaries are just a key value pair. So like right here in my first dictionary, I have John, and this is a string, and I remember strings are immutable, so this is fine to use as a key, but I couldn't use like a list or something here. That wouldn't work. It would have to be like an immutable data type. So I can't use a list or a dictionary as my key. But this is a string, so it's fine. So this is my key, and that's John. This is my value, which is 45. Let's just say that's their age or something. 
and then I put a comma, and that's my first entry to the dictionary. Then I have, and a colon separates it, by the way, and then I have my second entry to the dictionary, and then this is their value. So basically, you have a key and you have a value, and you can access either or, because I can say print first dictionary dot get and then I can get the key and I, I want to see if John is in the dictionary so let's see if that works and then it did so now it did yep John was in the dictionary and it got his value for us so that's one way that you can get the value of the key I like get a lot because it doesn't return an error if it's not in the dictionary because if you did something like this and you wanted to print the value you can also print the value by doing it this way you would reference the dictionary name and then you reference the key and then you print that and that works see i need to stop slicing i don't know what the heck i'm doing down here <laughs> sorry uh, but yeah see that works and that got his age which was 45 wherever the heck i put it at oh here we go that worked like that's fine but what if john wasn't in the dictionary or what if i like type out his name well then i'm gonna get an error see it's like hey it's like key error this guy isn't in the dictionary but if I did the same thing with get, I could just say print dot get, and I could say John. Let me type it pretty much the same way I had it before. So see, none. But see, it didn't give us an error. It didn't break our whole code. It just gave none, and then there we go. So I don't know. I kind of like the dot get method. I think you guys should know that. I don't, I don't think it'll be on the final, but I did want to cover it because it is pretty important. Okay. But that's how to access this. So what I but what I want to clarify, I want to clarify something. John is the key. John is the key to this dictionary. Like the, it's a key in the dictionary. But John is not the value. The value is this whole string. This whole well not the string, but this whole expression right here. This represents 45 because that's John's value. I really want to stress these terms because normally I don't care if you know the terms, but this actually is important. This is the key. This is the value. The key points to the value, but they are not the same. They're just linked. I mean, they could be the same. Like I could make this also John, but they're not the exact same object. Like that's two different objects. Like there's the key object and then there's the value object. And even if I did make this John, like even if they were exactly the same, it, they're not the same object in memory. Those are stored in two different areas in your RAM, and it will point to wherever the other one is, like in terms of, you know, hashing and all that. But it's not the same object. Like they're not exactly the same spot in RAM, essentially. So anyway, just to clarify that. So this is not the key. We use the key to return the value in the same way that when I was indexing the list, like if I did unsorted list, like print unsorted list zero this represents only three not the whole list and not a list of three unless i was slicing but we didn't we're not slicing so because we're just indexing it just ref, like this whole section this whole block of code will return three specifically because that's what we index for okay i want to make that clarification because i see people mess that up sometimes and i just I really want to clarify that just so it's really clear. Okay, so now if we want to change what the, uh, what, like if we want to go in and we want to modify that dictionary entry, and let's say, oh, John told me he actually wasn't 45. He, I must have heard that from somebody and they must have not actually known what his age was. He was actually 44, still pretty close. So I can go in and I can say, okay, this value of John now equals. 44 and now if i print our whole dictionary it should print out john 44 and then you know nancy 33 and all that so now it modified john's entry but if i printed that before that statement then it should do the 45 see right there it printed and then we made the change and then this changed it to 44 easy now, what if I want to add something else to this dictionary? Or what if I don't know what I want to put in the dictionary immediately? So then I can just say, okay, well, now I want to add a new person's name. Let's call him Joe or something, I guess. 
So we could say first dictionary, because I want to modify this specific dictionary. And I want to call him Joe. And I want his age to be, I don't know, 35. Okay, so now if I execute this line of code and now I print my dictionary again, then now it should print Joe in there. See? Easy. Now it just adds it to the end of the dictionary, but this isn't sorted in any kind of way. So, you know, it, it this doesn't really like sort anything, but it doesn't have to because it's just a dictionary. It's kind of all unsorted in that way. It really doesn't matter. So, I mean, I guess it is sorted from, like, descending order in terms of the values, but that was just a coincidence, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, either way, okay, moving on. All right, so what else do we need to know about dictionaries? Add key value pairs, yep, we talked about that. Retrieve a value, yep, talked about that in two different ways. Traverse by the key, traverse by the key in sorted order. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're going to do some experimenting, because I don't know about this myself, and I'm very happy to learn with you guys on the fly. So let me look at dictionaries here. Let's look at our articles. So let's look at the uh, docs for dictionaries, and let's see what we can do with dictionaries. So let's see their methods. Okay, I'm looking to see if there is a... <sighs> Sorry. Nope, there's not. Okay, I was checking to see if there's a sort method. But it looks like there's not. Okay. That's fine. That's cool. Okay. So I want to sort this dictionary. And I want to sort it by name. So let's go ahead and add Joe in there. Um, Because this is already sorted. Yeah. I want to add Joe in there. We're going to add Joe back. Joe, you're coming in with us. Okay. So now... What I want to do is I want to traverse by this dictionary in a sorted order. But let's go ahead and show you how you would traverse by dictionaries. So the the exam will also cover traversing not through by items, but you can also traverse through the keys and through the values. But I want to go ahead and show you this real quick. And then we'll talk about sorting because I think I kind of need to talk about this first. So I basically I call this enumerating like uh, enumerating, but it's not technically like, you know, and I guess you don't necessarily have to call it that but essentially like you know either way so this is saying for key and value or sorry for key value in input dict dot item so if we called this function and we passed in our first dictionary like we did here it would actually go through and it would print out each item in the dictionary with its value so we can show you here so it said the key was John, and then the value was 45, and then the key was Nancy, and the value was 37. And it, sh it does that all on a fancy little F string, essentially. So it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. So, um, all right. So we're traversing through by items, but I really want to sort that. But let's just traverse through the keys. So let me just... Sorry. Let me just do that. So I want to test something with you guys, because I have not done this in a while I don't think I might have done it before I can't remember but I've not done it in a while if I have so let's see what happens if we pass in sorted let's see what it prints out oh okay so the sorted function will sort it by the keys it didn't sort it by the values because actually the values if you're sorting in ascending order not descending it would have done Joe first and then Nancy and then John and it didn't do that it did Joe John and Nancy so it's sorting by the keys because it's sorting in ascending order this is the first one alphabetically, this is the second one, this is the third one, and we can see that it's sorting by that. Now notice, when we printed that, it returned a list. So it actually sorted the list of keys, because if I just, if I don't do that, let me show you what I'm talking about. We can actually use the keys method for dictionaries to get the list of all the keys in the dictionary. So let me show you that. So if I just print that, here we go. And then it gives us, well, it gives us a dict keys object, but we could just, you know, we could just wrap this in a list constructor, essentially like a list type casting function, just to fully not confuse you guys specifically. I mean, it would have been the same, like Python wise, but yeah. So see, now this is a list of all the strings of all the names, because in our list, we had this here and then this here and then this here. And then these, all these keys are strings. So it just returned the list of strings. Simple enough. Okay. So you can also do the same thing with the values. And so if I do that, 
And there we go. This is the list of all the ages that I put in. This is the... Now, I will say some of these things, I mean, the keys might be helpful, but the values typically, you might not find this helpful. Like, it really depends on what you're doing. I just want to show you because you could, this could come up, but, you know, it may not be helpful just to get all the values of a dictionary without really having the context of what key they're for and stuff like that. So I think where dictionaries really shine is the relationship between the key and the value, like this key has this value and this key has this value and stuff like that. I mean, I think if you just have the list of keys and the list of values, it may not be super helpful in some ways, but I'll leave that up to you for you guys to figure out when you're going to use that. Now, dot items, on the other hand, actually will generate a list of tuples. And so we haven't covered tuples in this class, and unfortunately we don't really cover them ever, but you can think of a tuple like a list, but it's an immutable list, essentially. And it uses parentheses instead of brackets. That's that's really all you need to know about tuples, essentially. So I'm not going to cover all of it, because there's a lot more I could say, but that's pretty much all you need to know. So this is a list of tuples. So we have our first key and our first value, and then our second key and our second value, and our third key and our third value. And so each item in the tuple is going to be the key and the value, and the first item in the tuple is always going to be the key for that entry, and the second item is always going to be the value. So when I say for key value in input dict items, what I'm actually doing is I'm generating this list of tuples, and then I'm saying key is going to be equal to whatever the first item in the tuple is, and value is going to be equal to whatever the second item in the tuple is. And so on the first iteration, key would be equal to John, and then value would be equal to 45, and then on the second iteration, the key would be Nancy, and then the value would be 37. So like that's what these words will equal. And that's why we have to put a comma there, because we're 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 doing something in Python that's called unpacking, which means that um, like I'll show you. I'll show you what I'm talking about. If we have a tuple variable, like say example tuple is equal to uh, one let's not use numbers, let's just say test. One, two, three. All right. So if I have a tuple here, I can say, instead of saying example tuple, what I, well, actually, you know what I could just say? First item, comma, second item is equal to, and then I could just use that. So this is how I would define a tuple variable, but I could also unpack this variable. Whoops. I didn't mean to cut that. I could unpack this variable. And now if I printed first item here, watch what happens first item was there a print statement i had somewhere that printed all this stuff out oh here it is okay i didn't want to print too much to the console to confuse you guys okay see now it printed test and then i could do the same thing i could print the second item if i wanted to and it would be one two three but essentially that's what's known as unpacking so that's why we have to put the comma there because we're actually unpacking this variable because it comes in pairs like that as we saw so we want to say this is the first item in the pair this is the second item in the pair but on each iteration, it's only looking at one of these tuples at a time because it's a list where every item in the list is a tuple. So it's kind of like a two-dimensional sort of list in that way. But anyway, OK, OK, back to what I was talking about. So, um, yeah, so you can traverse through a dictionary by just traversing through the keys. So you could say like for key in input dict dot keys right here instead of items. And then you could just say for value in input dict dot values if you wanted to traverse just through the values. But if you want to traverse through both at the same time, which I find pretty helpful, you could just do for key value in input uh, dict items. Now, one thing that you could do is you could say, I'll just do it in the global space here. You could say for key in first dictionary dot keys. And then inside of your loop somewhere, you can say value is equal to first dictionary key. And now you kind of are traversing through both. So if this confuses you, like if this line confuses you too much and you don't think you can remember this, just traverse through it by keys and then do this. Like just set the value equal to the first dictionary and then index by the key. And then that will get you the value. So now you have both variables. Now you could say like print key. Let's just use that same exact print statement. So I'll show you. So yeah, see it's the same thing. And then I don't have to return anything. I can just print that. And then um, I'm going to call, well, I'm not going to call anything because this is in the global namespace, but I'm going to call this function 
And they should print the same exact thing to the console twice. So let me see. Do I have another print statement here or did I remove it? Okay, sorry. I'm checking all my prints. <laughs> see, so it printed the same thing twice. So this was the first time it did it, and then this is the second time that it did it. See? Same exact thing. So if that's confusing for you, you don't have to know items or whatever. Like, I don't think it'll be on the exam specifically. I mean, it does say that you need to know what the items returns, but like, you know, you don't have to know how to traverse specifically through items. I think that's kind of an advanced thing. But if that confuses you, just do this. I don't care how you do it. Whatever gets the job done, I really don't care. But anyway. Okay, moving on. I think that covers everything I need to talk about about dictionaries. Um... Traverse through sorted order. So we could say this. Could say sorted. And now this will actually do a slightly different iteration. It'll traverse through in a different order. See, this time it did Joe, John, and then Nancy, whereas the unsorted version did John, Nancy, and then Joe. So you could just like change what you're iterating through. Or you could set this equal to a variable and then, you know, do that. But it depends on what you're trying to do here, but Anyway, okay, moving on for the sake of time. Because we still need to talk about classes, and I've got so much stuff to say about classes. I think I've covered pretty much everything on this whole top half. Um, before we talk about classes, let me go ahead and look through the rest. Because I want to save the classes for last. I'm actually not going to cover in, by the way, because I actually covered it in my midterm video. I didn't know that it would be on the final thing, but I, I went ahead and covered it on the midterm video, so that was awesome so you don't have to know that i'm not going to cover this again even though i kind of botched my explanation the first time around <laughs> um, i do have one quick thing i need to correct on my on my midterm video i said that for loops are better for if you have a specific set list of things you're iterating through and while loops are better if you don't necessarily like know how many times you're going to iterate through it that is true but i want to add to what i was saying in that while loops are perfectly valid to iterate through things if you're iterating through like a list of things even though for loops are a little bit easier while loops are perfectly valid to do and specifically what i really want to add this is really important when you guys start working on harder problems like leak code problems like interview problems and stuff that you might see for your interviews for programming jobs um there may be a time where you have to traverse through something but you have to change what like what your what your index is so like here for example when i'm traversing through this string like if the if the word was like w o r d like word if that was my string then on the first iteration it would print zero and then w and then one and then like o and so on but let's say i wanted to just do two here so let me get rid of my dictionary stuff for now oh also if you if you reference if your val if your value in a dictionary is a list, then like just be aware of your data types. Your values can also be bigger things. Like they don't have to be just numbers. They can also be lists. But I'm not gonna bother talking about that because I, I trust you guys to kind of research that yourself. So I'm I'm really not gonna bother with it because I don't want to spend too much time on this video. I don't want to make this like it's already almost an hour and we still haven't covered classes yet. So I really don't want to make this like super long. But anyway, so um, yeah, so I could call this function now. And I could use the word word, so we could say traverse index while loop, and then I could say word. Now it's only going to print every other letter, so it should just print W, and then it should print R, and then it shouldn't print anything else. So yep, it did the O and R, or sorry, the zero and W, and the two and R, and then it didn't print anything else. That's the beauty of while loops is I could change how many times I like I can and see I can actually move the. Uh, the I back, so I could say if, well, I'm not gonna do that here, but like if I wanted to, like if you're traversing through a list or something, you can actually move that I, like I could actually say I minus equals one. And now, like I know this won't really do anything because it's just basically the same as what I had it before, but now it will print the whole entire thing. But what happened was I actually jumped two times and then it jumped back. But see, the key difference here between this and what this is doing is that I can't actually change what I is in the for loop. Like, yeah, I can change it underneath all this stuff. Like, I could say I plus equals, like, six or something. But the thing is, it won't actually matter. Like, it won't change anything. 
Like, okay, well, it will break my code here. Like, underneath it. I guess I should have put it, like, as the last line of my code. But it will it will break the code if I do it there, because then I'll get indexed out of range and stuff. But here, it won't actually matter. And I'll show you this. So I can talk about debugging now. Woohoo! So let me just get rid of that. And I will call this function real quick. Oh, goodness. It's been a day, guys. It's been a day. All right. Okay. So let me show you this. For those of you who don't know, um, when you when you modify your I or sorry, when you're running a for loop, the for loop actually executes this line every single time on your for loop. So if I go to debug this, I can show you what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and do that. So by the way, I just put these little breakpoints there. You, I just saw I, I just go over by the lines and I click these little red dots. And then I click up here and then I click debug. There's also a run and debug that you might see. So that's how that's how you start debugging. So now it's executed everything in this file up until this line. So now we're stuck on this line. So I'm going to tell it to go ahead and execute this line. So there it goes. Um, okay. So now we've called this function. I didn't put a breakpoint here, so let me actually do that. Because what actually just happened was we executed this line, and now Python said, okay, let's go down here. And then when we executed this line, like, see, I'll show you, it jumps here. It didn't jump here yet because we didn't actually call the function yet. This is just the definition of the function. But now we define the function in the global namespace. Now we're calling the function. So now when we call the function, it's going to go down here, and it's going to start, like, actually going through the loop. So we can see that. So next line, let's go ahead and execute. So now we click this button up here, by the way, it's called continue. I like to call it the little pause play button because that helps people visually see what I'm talking about. But the uh, the continue button will actually go ahead and execute whatever line that it's highlighted yellow. So, um, okay, so now let's start our loop. So we have our string here, word. So that's the string to traverse. So we know what our parameter variable actually is now. Um, the length of that is going to be 4, so this is going to generate a range of numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. And so i should be 0 on the first iteration, and then 1 on the second, 2 on the third, and 3rd on the fourth. So, I don't know how I said that just now without messing that up. <laughs> That's skill. Okay. Alright, so i is 0. Okay, so yeah, we already know what happens on the first iteration. The first iteration is not all that important. Until we get to this line, watch what happens. I want you to pay close attention up here to where you can see the variable values. Watch what happens to i. It's going to change to 5. But see here, the for loop is going to change i back. So let's go ahead and execute that. See, now i is 1. So this doesn't actually change anything. But check this out. If I go here, and I won't do this actually, we'll just, we'll just comment this line out. And let's. Oh, could this be? I need to go to bed or something. What the heck? All right. Traverse by while loop. And then word. Okay. So now if I call this function, let's debug this function. So let's do the same thing on our while loop. So I. Oh, this would have been an infinite loop. <laughs> Whoops. So let's do the same thing, though. Let's do the exact same code. So, well, actually. Well, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. All right, so now if I go to debug this, now let's see what happens. It's going to skip most of this because like, yeah, it's going to do the definition line, but then it's going to go down here. So now it's going to go to our function call. So we went ahead and, and by the way, this is what happens when you make a Python file that has a bunch of functions in it. When you define the functions, the definition lines, like all the signature lines, they will all execute first. But that's all they do. Like all you're telling Python is, okay, I want. It's basically like making a variable. It's like making a placeholder. It's just, it's just saying, okay, I have a function object and it's this name and all that. But it doesn't actually execute anything in the function until you call the function. Then it goes in the function and actually executes. But when you when you're just doing this, it just kind of like does the signature executions, but it doesn't do everything else. Okay. All right. So i is zero. So while i is less than the length of the string, okay, so the length of the string is 4. I probably should have saved this to a variable of some kind so you can see that visually. But anyway, so the current character is going to be w. That makes sense. So let's go ahead and print that. Same exact thing. But watch what happens now. i is going to be 5. Okay. 
So now i is 5, and all we're actually checking here is if i is less than the length of the string. And in this case, well, it it's not anymore. So it's actually not going to do anything else. So, boom. But see, this code right here, literally, this code is exactly the same code. But these loops do two completely different things. And that's because while loops actually do let you change your own custom control variables, whereas in the for loop, you can never actually change this on the next iteration of whatever you're doing. The next iteration is always going to be defined. You might change it like right at the top. Like you might say, okay, well, forget that nonsense. I want I to actually be like double what it actually is. So you could just say I times two. So whatever it is, I just want it to be two before we do the rest of the stuff. And you could do that, but it'd be kind of pointless if you're doing range. Cause like, why not just make your range, you know, those numbers instead, but whatever. But anyway, so you can't do that, but you have to do it above all your code. You can't do it on the bottom and expect it to matter. That's what I was trying to get at. So that's, I wanted to make that clarification because um, it does come up when you start doing harder coding problems. Not really anything in this class, but when you start doing like really harder, like, is that even a, is that grammatically correct? Really hard, much harder stuff, uh, especially like interview questions, like, you know, data structures and algorithms and stuff like that. So I just want to mention that. Okay. All right. Um, that's a clarification I wanted to make. Uh, okay, there is one more thing I wanted to add on, and then I'll and then we'll move on to the rest of the PDF. So this comes up in one of the worksheets I saw before the midterm was due. Uh, it was one of those worksheets, and it was saying, "How do we know which else this else belongs to?" Here's the thing: I can say, actually, let me not do it in this function. Let me not do it in this function. Let me not do that. Uh, also, let me change the i value so that this function works again. Uh, okay, let's just scroll way down here. Just way down. All right. So, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, if statements. Okay, so if x, we don't, we haven't defined x, so it's going to be confused. But we could say if x, then print x. And then else print, I don't know, else, I guess. Okay, so here's the thing. This code works, but what if I did this? What if I did this? What if I said if y, then print y, and then else, print else2, just to be specific. Okay, how does Python know what if this else belongs to? Some of you guys answered this right, but I want to make a clarification while I have the time. The thing is, Python knows that this elf else belongs to this if because they're on the same indentation. That's what you guys said, and that is correct. But there's also another part, because you see, I can also do this. I can also say, if z, then print z. Else, print else Oops, else three. Here's the thing, this is looking really confusing. <laughs> but here's the thing. The reason that else, like, okay, what I wanted to clarify here is you can have multiple ifs and else, like on the same indentation. But the way Python is gonna execute this is it's gonna check if y is true. If y is true, then it will print y. If y isn't true, it's gonna print else two. No matter what else happens, it's gonna print else two. That's like a given. But here's the thing, after it does either one of these print statements, it's gonna still go down here and check if Z is true. So now it's gonna say, okay, like X was true, so we did X and now we're gonna check Y. Okay, Y was true, now we're gonna print Y. Now, instead of doing the else, we don't need to do the else. Now we're still gonna keep executing. So, okay, if Z is true, now we're gonna print Z. But the reason I can have two else's here is because it knows that the else refers to all the stuff above the if until you get to the top if. So I could have like if C and L if A, then print A. So the thing is, the thing about conditionals is the way Python's going to execute this is it's going to check if X is true. If not, it's going to print else and be done with this whole thing. But if X is true, then it's going to print X. Now it's going to check Y. If Y is true, then it's going to print Y or it's going to print the else. But then 
after it does this block of code, it's going to go ahead and, and try this section. So is Z true? No. Okay. Is A true? Yep. Print A. But if Z was true, then it's not going to check the elif. I did cover that in my midterm video, but I want to clarify the reason that Python knows that this else belongs to this block is because the else takes a look at all the other ifs above it and on the same indentation. So I want to make that clarification because I think most of you knew this, but I just want to really hammer that into your brain. The reason that this particular else, for example, knows that it doesn't belong to like all this is because it's on the same indentation, yes, but it's also only looking at the elifs and ifs above it. But like here, this is a whole different section of ifs and elses, just so you know. And this is like actually valid code, like other than the fact that I didn't define these variables, which it would yell at me about. But if these were actual like variables, like I could just make a bunch of variables, this actually would execute. In fact, let me show you that. Let me not, let me just shut up and let me just show you. So let's make X something that would be true. So let's say one. And let's make Y something that would be true. So let's make it one. It doesn't matter. It can be, it can be two, three, four, five, any number, as long as it's not zero. We talked about that in the midterm thing. Uh, Z will also just be one. For the sake of the argument, I'll just make all of these uh, easy numbers. And then A will be one. Okay. So I'm going to show you this visually and then we're going to debug it and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So the way this is going to execute is it's going to go here to if X. X is true. It's going to print X. It's going to go to Y. Y was true. Print Y. Skip this. It's going to go to Z. Z was false. So it's not going to do this. Now it's going to check the elif A and elif A, A was true. So it's going to print A. It's going to skip this and it's not going to do this because the X was true. So it's not going to do this. So the order that this is going to happen is it's going to do this and it's going to do this. It's going to check this, which is going to be false. It's going to check this, which is going to be true. And it's going to do this. And then it's going to skip to the rest. And then that'll be the whole Python file. So let me show you. Let's put breakpoints on every single line, just so I can show you. For the sake of my OCD, I'm going to space this out. <laughs> Sorry. I have like pretty bad OCD about that stuff. OK. And by the way, anytime you guys send me your files, that's the first thing I do is correct the formatting. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, I've got some, I got some OCD like you wouldn't believe, I'm telling you. Okay, all right, so let's debug this. Okay, so, oh, we're still debugging the, <laughs> whoops, oopsie, oopsie, darling, I don't need to debug all that, sorry. Okay, so we have all of our, I probably should have picked a different variable name, I probably should have said W or something, but we have all of our variables, so you have Y up here, and then we have our X, Y, and Z down here. So let's go ahead and do this. So I told you it would check if X is true. And if it is, then it's going to do the print. So I know that the next line is not going to be any of these two lines because I know X is true. So, yep, there we go. So now it's going to print X. Okay, that's one. So now it's going to check if Y is true. Okay, is Y true? Yep, should be. Okay, now it's going to print Y. Now it's going to skip the else, like I said. Now it's going to check if Z is true. This is what I was talking about, about ifs versus elifs. It's going to check every single if on the same indentation. So if this was like a bunch of elifs, it wouldn't have even bothered doing the rest of this code. But because this is an if, it's going to check it. Okay, so now if z. All right. Well, z wasn't true because z was zero. So if, if the number is zero and it's an integer, then all integer zeros will evaluate to false. Okay. Now, A should be true, though, because A was 1. So I told you it would go to Z, and it wouldn't print because it wasn't true. And now it's going to check the elif. So see, what's going to happen here is it's going to do this. It's going to print, and then it's going to skip the else. And we already skipped this else because the, uh, the if up here was true. So it's going to skip this else <coughs> Excuse me, as soon as this isn't true. Or, like, sorry, as soon as this is done executing. So, boom, there it go. And then, yeah, see, now we just got 111 to the console, which is true because all of our three variables that we were printing were all true, which was one. So, yeah, anyway, so I just want to make that clarification about ifs. This probably looks like a nightmare to look at, but it is what it is. Anyway, all right, moving on. I think we should talk about classes now. Let's see if there's any quick things we can cover. Um, split. I'm not going to go over split because it's in the string documents like I showed you before uh, somewhere in here. I don't know. It's in here. I think I might have. I was clicking on something else. But if you go to the string uh, stuff, it's in there. But basically, it returns a list of strings based on whatever you split by. You guys should have pretty good practice with split by now, so I'm not really going to spend time covering it. Join, on the other hand, is like the opposite. So you could say, like, 
my numbers are going to be equal to, and then you put a, like, a string literal. And I'm going to put a space because I want these numbers to be separated by a space and a comma. So I'm going to do join, and then I have to pass in an iterable, so we're going to use our list here. So now if we print my nums, and then we print the type of my nums, it should be that list in a string, and then the type should be a string. So if we run this code now, it should print the, uh, whoops, sequence type, expected and found. Uh-oh, where did we mess up? My nums, comma, join. Expected string instance, int found. What? Where do we mess up, guys? What is going on? Join unsorted list. Did we do something to this list of some kind that I'm not aware of? Join unsorted list. Wait, expect it? I, sequence item zero. Okay, I guess we're debugging in real time now, guys. Okay, sequence item zero. Expected string instance. Expected a string instance. It found. Does join have to use a list of strings? Can it not just use integers? I can change that real quick, but that's weird. I will have learned something. I get to I get to teach you guys while I'm learning it. Okay. Um, so we have our list here. Yep, it didn't get modified anywhere. Okay, so let's make that change real quick, and let's see if that fixes it. Let's just make our list a lot smaller for now, so that I don't have to type in a bunch of quotes for everything. So let's just say two. All right, let's see if that works. Cool, I learned something about join. Sweet, I get to teach you guys, right, on the, you know, while we're doing it. So it was saying the reason we were getting that error was because apparently... If you do join, everything in the list, or at least that slice of the list, has to be a string. So you can't, like, join a bunch of numbers into a string. It has to be a, a bunch of strings of numbers. So, just so you know, and so that I know. But anyway, it created a string that was like, quote, one comma space two, quote, essentially was the string. So, yep, D2L, I'm still here. Please just don't kick me out. Thanks. Okay. So that's the join method. It basically, it, you might have noticed this, join basically does the exact opposite of what string do, or split does. So it's a string method that does the opposite of split, essentially. Okay. All right. Okie dokie. So string literals are always enclosed in quotes. Yep, already talked about that. Input, yep, already talked about that. Uh, that's on the midterm stuff. This is also on the midterm stuff. Talked about that already. Replace. Replace is a string method, and upper and lower are string methods. And I'm not going to talk about those because I covered those in the, like, it's covered in the docs that I linked already. So, again, I'd just be repeating myself. But um, count is also a string and a list method. So here, if we go to count, see it's showing up as a proper method. But we can also do list.count. See? It shows up there, too. I don't know if it shows up in other... Uh, data types. Let's see. Let's see if it does. Dict dot count. Nope. It's not a dictionary method. Integer int dot count. It counts the bits, but it doesn't count the actual. Yeah. There's no count method for bits. Or sorry, ints. And then floats. Floats dot count. Nope. That makes sense because the numeric data types aren't iterable anyway, so I don't think it would have a way to know how to do that unless it was like programmed into Python essentially. Uh, okay. And then booleans, you can't really count booleans. Tuples, maybe. We don't cover tuples in this class. Okay, tuples can do it. So, uh, the answer to this question is tuples, lists, and strings. But you don't have to worry about tuples because we don't cover them in this class primarily. But strings and lists both can do count. That's actually a method of both of them. Okay. Now how the print function works. Yep, talked about this. Max. Max is a good one. I want to show you guys something. Let me move my camera for just a second. It's going to be in a weird place, but let me just move it to like the middle. I don't know. I guess I can put myself over here. So here's something really cool. Um, in the Python docs that I linked in the beginner's guide, let's go all the way up. Just we Okay. Uh, Python docs, general helpful links. It's in the helpful links section. If 
you go here, this is the overall docs, and I'm just going to go ahead and click on it so you can see like where you guys would go. So you click on it. If you look at this part here, built-in functions, this is so helpful. This shows you all the functions you can do, including print in Python. So like it, print is in here. So if I want to type print, like that's in here. Where's alphabet? Help me out here. Here we go. Print. Okay. Right. So there's print. There's open. You guys were using the open function for file objects. Uh, here's the any and all functions I've talked about before. There's enumerate. I showed you enumerate before. That was the like key value and like, well, that was the dictionary objects, but it's like index element kind of thing, like for index element and all that. So yeah, this is like really, like this is really helpful. So please like bookmark this if you can. But uh, anyway, okay. So what were we doing? I was, I was going to look up a function. Okay, max, right, right, right. Okay, max. So let's look that up. So if we go to here to max, Max says it takes an iterable object as an argument. So it returns the largest item in an iterable object. Okay. All right. So um, it can also take multiple arguments, but we're just going to work on the iterables. So you can say max, and then you can say, um, you can either say, well, it actually works in both ways. Let me move my camera back now, by the way. Okay. So you could say max... And then you could have your two variables. And let's say I have my two variables. I have A and B. So A is 1 and B is like 3 or something. So I could say, give me the max between A and B. And it will return that. So you have to print it. And then if you do that, there we go. It should print 3 because that's what B's value was. So there you go. So it printed 3. But you can also do this with a list. So I could also make this a list of items. So if you have a list, like, uh, for example, the let's make our list back to numbers again. So let's say one, two, three, four. So I could pass in that list variable. And I could say unsorted list. Actually, that's not a good name because it actually is sorted now. <laughs> okay, so I could run this code and it would give me four because that's the highest number in the list. That's what max does. Pretty straightforward. Um, what was the other one? Sum, I think. Sum, pretty much also easy. Uh, in this case, sum will just give me the sum of all the numbers. So it'd be 1 plus 2, which is 3. 3 plus 3, which is 6. 6 plus 4, which is 10. So this should print out 10 to the console. And there we go. So pretty straightforward. You can also use this in conjunction with the length function. So I talked about the length function already in the midterm, so that's why I didn't really cover it in this video. But the length will just give you the number of items and whatever it is. So in this case, it would give me 4. <clears throat> Excuse me, because four is the number of items in this list. So now if we divide the sum by the length, that actually gives us the average. So we can make this a little bit more readable for our code. And we could say average is equal to this. And now we could just print the average. And the average should be, I don't know, what would that be? 10 divided by four, which is the same as saying five divided by two, which is the same as saying 2.5. Yeah, look at that. Quick math. There we go. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Yep. So, pretty straightforward. Round is also... Uh, don't forget round. So, if I if one of those variables was like, let's say, 1.007, if I just wanted to round that to the first decimal place, or the second decimal, I could just say round. I can't remember if it's the first or second. I guess we're going to find out. So, you pass in the first item, which is the thing that you want to round, and then the second item is going to be how many digits you want to round it to. I think one is a whole number, so let's try two, and let's see if that gets us 1.0. Oh, okay. I had it wrong. Okay. No worries. We're all learning. It's all good. So, it's kind of like index then. So, yeah, if I just want a 1.0, we just use one, because it's rounded to one decimal place. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. That makes sense. So that's how you use the round function. Pretty straightforward. It's literally that easy. You just give it the thing that you want to round and then the other argument, the comma, and like the other argument of whatever like thing it is, however many places you want to round it to. Okay. All right. Alrighty. Moving on. And then we'll talk about classes and then we'll be done pretty much. I just want to make sure there wasn't anything else I didn't cover. String concatenation. Yep. Covered most of that. Understand what happens if you modify the control variable. Oh, excuse me. Yep, we actually talked about this already. Uh, know how to build strings. Okay, um, I'm not going to cover this for the sake of time because I already covered this in the midterm. I didn't cover it with dictionaries, but it's basically, you can figure that out. I mean, it's basically just 
how you guys made a new entry in the dictionary. Just imagine that for a for loop, basically. Okay, know how to work with files. Yep, I'm, I pretty much already covered those. CSV files are exactly the same as normal text files. It's just that they have commas separating the items. So you just have to use the split function to separate your lines. Um, so it would be like, I don't know, like for line and example. Sorry, open example.csv read mode. You would just say split line is equal to line dot split by comma. And now you could index that and then that will give you each item in the CSV. So however many items there are in the CSV, or you could iterate through that if you wanted to. Um, so you could then say like for item in split line, then print item. And that would print out each item in the row. And then as it's going to the next iteration, it would go to the next item and it would print all the items in that row and so on and so forth. Except it would print each item on its own line. So it might look a little confusing, but you know, it is what it is. Anyway, okay, moving on. All right. Um, know how to traverse a dictionary by key using a for loop. Yep. Uh, know how to create and modify lists and dictionaries. Yep. Index by integers, index by keys. Yep. Animable type. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, we covered all this. All right, sweet. Now we can talk about classes and then we'll be done. I swear to God. So we're trying to, I said I would hopefully be in under an hour and a half. Unfortunately, we're going to be a little bit over that, but I'm going to try to stay under two hours. So I promise it shouldn't be longer than two hours. All right, classes. I actually made a whole file for this. Um, so let me open it up real quick. Let me open it up for you guys. And then I don't need this anymore. All right, so let's talk about classes. Okay, whoops. I didn't mean to do that. Um, okay, so classes, classes and objects. All right, I need to go to my Python docs for this because I made a wonderful um, overview of classes and objects for you guys. Please, if you're studying for the final, please, for the love of God, use my resource guide, please. I, I promise you it'll be very helpful for you. Um, Anyway, yeah, this is all the stuff that I talked about, about classes. Like, look at all this. I went through so much. And I'm not going to talk about the init versus the repr thing because I talked about that in the doc. So I don't mean to sound lazy here, but I, I really just don't want to repeat myself when I already talked about stuff. So just for the sake of my time and yours, just please read the doc. Uh, and it'll be linked in the description. But anyway, classes are basically just a way to organize the structure of your objects. And you're basically... When you have an object in Python, essentially every object is just like a structure of a bunch of other data types. Like in my image, I'll show you this visually. In my image I made here, which this is why I'm not an artist. <laughs> Let me blow this up a little bit. So our object one, this is our object. So imagine like class and this is like my object. So object one, this is our first object. It has an attribute here. One of its attributes is a string. And let's say this is like a book or something. So this is the name of the book, let's say. And then the integer could be like how many pages the book has. And then let's say this object here is another attribute of the object. So this is what I wanted to get into. And I was going to kind of like gradually lean into this, but I really don't know how I can talk about it without just going right into it. So objects can have attributes that point to other objects and it can create this sort of tree structure. And it can also loop back around on itself and it can like point to the same object and it can get kind of confusing, but I don't want you to worry too much about that because that goes like way deep into object oriented programming and you don't have to worry about that essentially. But um, anyway, you can have an attribute of an object that points to another object. So for example, going with our book example. So this object was a book. This was a book object, let's say. This was the name of the book, the title of the book. And then this was the number of pages of the book. Now, this object too, let's say this is a page. So this could be like a page. So this could be like, I don't know, the number of words on the page, like this integer attribute here. But in order to access this in integer attribute, I have to first access the object. And then I have to say object one dot object two, whatever the name of that class is. And then I have to say, dot whatever the name of the like i don't know number of words let's say if that's the name of my attribute so you have to say object one dot object two dot 
number of words and that will get you to this or you could just reference the second class essentially by itself but you know either way but so you kind of have to follow the tree so that's why i was saying like objects can have attributes that are other objects and this actually comes up in real coding it sounds kind of weird but it does come up in real coding i can show you this actually and my python docs uh or one of my python projects i'm working on it's a discord bot for python and sometimes you'll be like doing things that point to other objects so say for example like i don't know let's say activity maybe actually let's go to the models that's where i really want to show you guys discord models guild i think might be better okay so let's see let's see what we got here so fetch members okay so members so if you so here's the thing if you called this in your discord code like let's say you were making a discord bot if you called this function i'm not going to go into that because i'm not going to explain all of coding in discord but if you called this function essentially it would return a member object so you can see the usage right here you can say async for member in guild.fetch members. This is the function call. This returns a list of member objects and the member objects, it can be referenced here. So some methods, this is a this is an object method and I'll go over methods in a second. Some methods also can re like return a different object essentially. So it's like, okay, so, okay, this returns a discord.member object. So let's open that in a new tab and let's look at that. All right, so this is all the stuff I can do with members right here now that it loaded in. So this is all the attributes of members. I can get like their, I can get if they're a bot or not. I can get like their Discord color. I can get their, like their name or their nickname or whatever. So anyway, um, I don't want to get too deep into that because that goes really, really deep into object-oriented programming. But uh, anyway, so attributes. So if you have an object, your attributes are just data types. But what I wanted to show you, what I really want you to show you is just forget everything I just said. Just focus on this. What I want to show you is, if you follow this tree all the way down, eventually, if you hit the end of a tree, like let's say you have a branch, like this is like a branch of your tree, and this is like a leaf, as you would say, like in binary search trees, for example, at the leaves of your tree, at the final endpoints, the final nodes of your tree that end, that don't lead to another thing like this object too, the final endpoints are always, always, always going to be essentially built-in data types in python so you have a string you have an integer if i go to this object too i can get down to an integer and then a list of strings these are the built-in data types in python these are the built-in objects so okay so that's what I want you to know about object attributes. And I, if you're confused on this, don't worry. I did talk about it a little bit in the doc. You can read it here if you want to pause the video and just read what I said. Um, and then I kind of covered this a little bit in the object-oriented programming overview. So if you want more information on this, just kind of read through the doc if you want. But anyway, let's talk about methods though. So methods will return essentially, or well, they, they might not necessarily return because it depends on if it's a mutable or immutable object. If it's a mutable object, the method will modify the attributes. So like, for example, I could have a method that says like uh, book dot, like if this is a book object, I could say book dot change page number. And now like, let's say this was our page number or this was the page, I think. I don't know. Anyway, it could change this number. So now int is not like zero or one. Now it's like two or something. So methods typically change some attribute of the object. Usually they only change the attribute of the object that you're working with. Um, and if they do interact with other objects, it's usually to return other objects. They usually don't modify other objects in place. But again, that gets kind of deeper into object-oriented programming. But essentially a method in Python for like an object, generally speaking, modifies an attribute of the object. So keywords, object, it's like this thing. Hang on. It's like this. This is like my whole class, and this is the whole object, right? Well, not the main, but this. I have three methods. It has one attribute. It has self dot some string, and this is some string. It's a string. So I, you can forget about the wrapper for a minute. Um, but you, but this is my method. I put a upper method on here. So if I call my object dot upper, which I did, 
like I made an instance of it and we'll talk about instancing in a second. And then I called the sum string to see what its attribute was. This will return whatever the whatever the string was that we passed in when we called it. In this case, it was hello world. Um, this upper will now change hello world to actually be in all caps. So let's go ahead and run this code and it'll, it'll show you. So it has to do all its stuff here. Let's just kind of reprint it. Okay, this object has only this attribute, some string, which is this value, hello world, right? That's what it printed out. That was my first first uh, print statement. So now, and that's because we printed the actual object, because we printed the, um, yeah, we printed the wrapper string, which is why that printed out. And now it says the current object instance string attribute is hello world. So we didn't modify it yet. So this is our current attribute. So here we did object dot attribute. That's the syntax for accessing one of your attributes. So we did object dot attribute. And then this attribute was the name of the object instance was my object instance. The attribute name was some string. So we're saying ob my object instance dot substring and that's hello world. And that's where we're printing it. Okay, now since my object personally, the one that I just made, is a mutable data type, when I call this function, it should actually modify that attribute. So now this attribute should be in all caps because that's what upper does. It's like, okay, let's go see what the upper method does. Okay, this function modifies the string attribute to be all uppercase. Okay, see, it's actually redefining it because the string, the attribute itself is actually mutable, but the whole object, the whole object of my object is mutable. So. If I call this line now, now it's going to say, okay, now it's going to modify it to all uppercase, which it did. And then now, see, it says the new modified attribute is now hello world in all caps. And see, I didn't say like dot string dot upper. I didn't have to do that because it modified it in place. So I am I did the exact same variable, like this block of code, well, not the bracket, but this block of code right here is the exact same, literally the exact same. But because I called this method, now this is actually a different value than what this was see it's that easy methods just modify an attribute of some kind or they return a different object or they return some modified version of the object or like whatever but that's all that methods actually do so i mean they can do more but we won't get into that so um, that's the basis of object-oriented programming. So you have all these abstractable things in life and you want to abstract them away into objects. Now actually, if you guys are interested, I can show you one more example. Let me show you a real-world example of, of this concept. So I was working on a project here recently and one of the projects I was working on was the ability to extract text from websites and then summarize it with ChatGPT automatically. Um, it actually uses the web scraping free version of ChatGPT, which is like kind of, you know, probably shouldn't be doing that. But I just really did it to test it. I wasn't going to like deploy it large scale or anything. I just wanted to test this library. It actually doesn't work right now. <laughs> so I can't demonstrate the full concept to you because the summarization is not working. It's something to do with how I'm actually executing the function. So I'm going to be kind of vulnerable here for a minute and show you guys my broken code. But that is what it is. <laughs> That's how it goes, you know, can't be perfect. Oh, hang on, I'm chugging. My computer is getting mad at me because I'm opening too many things. Okay. All right. Okay, so I have these different objects. So you can ignore this one. This one's just like my main essentially. But I have these different objects. I have, I was troubleshooting it. That's why I had all these breakpoints here. Um, but I have these different objects. I have the text file object, which actually I didn't need the, I was, I think I, I was uh, inheriting. So I had that, but you don't need the parentheses, but this is how you make an object. So you say class and then the object name. So I have this object here and here I have the init method. And then here I have a header attribute. It's actually, this is actually a method, but because I use the property decorator, it turns it into an attribute. That's what that does. Here's a method. So this is an actual method of the, of the uh, class. And here's another method. And this one isn't good because all the, all the attributes I did are pretty much properties, but, uh, but here's like normal attributes that I did. But this is an example of real world object oriented programming, probably not the best object oriented programming. I'm probably not the best at it myself, but this is a real world example of it. Um, I have these different attributes. I have the website, which is where I'm extracting the text from. 
I have the text file, which I'm going to be modifying, and then I have the uh, ChatGPT bot, which will actually, like, you know, it has all the methods for, like, modifying the text and everything and modifying the prompts and stuff. Also, there's also a thing called static methods, which don't modify the instance. They only modify, like, they're just kind of, like, static things. It doesn't modify anything about the instance of the object, so... That's a real-world example of object-oriented programming, if you wanted to see with your own eyes instead of just seeing assignments and stuff. Um, whoops. Anyway, okay. So, let's go back to what our smaller example was. I'm going to close this out. I don't need this anymore. GitHub Desktop, by the way. Very helpful. Okay. So, I need to talk about instances. We've already talked about objects for so long, but I haven't even covered instances yet. So, it's really weird that I haven't talked about instances yet. So, this is how you define an object. You would say a class, and then you'd say the name of your object. Okay? And then this init method, you would say def init. And then the init method is for when you initialize the object, when you create an instance of it, or instantiate it, technically. So, whenever I create an instance of my object, I want it to execute this code. Now, this particular code is only actually saying that I want this attribute, which is going to be whatever the name of the object instance is. That's what self refers to. When you see self in object-oriented programming in Python, what I want you to replace that in your mind with is whatever the name of the instance variable is. So anytime I see self, I want to mentally replace that with whatever the instance variable name is. Like, not physically in my code, but... Mentally, I need to know that like self represents this basically like this block of code. Okay, so um, so when they create an instance of our object like they did here, they need to pass in something. So in the init method, you put self here, but then if you have anything that you need them to pass in, like it absolutely needs to be passed in, then that's where you would put this. So you would put whatever your thing is that you want to pass in. And so, okay, so they passed in a string. So now we're gonna say self dot sum string. So whatever their instance variable is, dot sum string should be equal to whatever the parameter is that they passed in, whatever the argument was when they actually give an argument for that call. So this method actually gets called when someone instance like instantiates an object. So when I say my object, the way I create an instance of the object is I reference the object name and then I reference, like, I put parentheses, and then I reference, like, you know, anything that I needed to pass in when I was calling the init method and all that. So when you type your object's name outside of the class, and then you put parentheses, you're actually making an instance of your object. And the instance can be modified and, and messed with. So now we have an instance, kind of like Turtle. Like, when you guys were doing Turtle, when you guys, like, I don't know if you guys remember this, way back when. But, like... When you guys were doing turtle and you said like Kevin is equal to turtle dot turtle, what you're actually saying is from the turtle Python file, import the turtle class. That's why it's highlighted in that same color that it is here. And then create an instance, which is why we use the parentheses, create an instance of the turtle object. So you guys didn't know it, but you guys were actually doing this on day one of this class. Well, maybe not day one. I think it was like week two that you actually started messing with turtle. But, you know, day one metaphorically speaking, you've been doing object-oriented programming this whole time. And any time that you've been messing with strings, or lists, or integers, or floats, or dictionaries, or tuples, or any kind of built-in data type, you've been using objects this entire time. Like, look, let me show you. If I do, like, print word dot upper, well, word is an instance, an instance, of the string class and word.upper specifically will return this whole word, but like uppercase. So if I ran this line of code, it would actually print this to the console. Like it would print, you know, WRD, which I, I know you guys know what upper does and what print does. But what I'm saying is it's actually like you're doing object-oriented programming. Like this is a method because you're doing something dot something. And this something is a method of the class. And this is an instance of the string class. 
I hope it just clicked for you because you've been doing this the whole time. So I don't want you to think that object-oriented programming is like this really scary, crazy thing. I mean, it can be in like really high levels, but you're not doing that in this class, so you don't have to worry about all that. But in this particular example, like it, it's really not as complicated as it sounds, essentially. Okay, so. Um, all right, I'm not going to cover wrapper. It's basically just like if you ever like try to print the object itself it will print out whatever your wrapper string is because that's what it represents so um i don't i'm not going to cover it because i did cover it quite a bit in the uh like i made a whole bullet point for it um uh, in the doc so i'm not going to cover it specifically but just know that that's a thing um okay and then this is your methods and then these are your attributes pretty much okay it's that simple that's all I want to talk about, about objects. Uh, let's see if there was anything else about them, though. Magic methods, int, wrapper. Yep, I already talked about that, kind of. Uh, instance variables. Yep, that instance variable is this. So this is the actual instance variable. So this is the instance variable. This is the class object itself. Well, the whole thing, I guess, is the whole instance. But this is the class object. But this is the instance object. So when I was saying before that there's certain methods called static methods and instance methods, instance methods modify the instance. See, this is saying self dot something, but a static method doesn't actually modify anything about the instance. It just kind of, well, I don't want to get, you guys don't use static methods, so I don't really want to go too deep into it, but basically you can just use it as a way to do stuff that doesn't require an actual instance of the thing essentially but i'm not gonna cover i'm you guys can look that up on your own time i'm not gonna waste time talking about that okay um let's see creating an object of your class yep that's basically just creating an object by doing this so you're instantiating an object as accessing the data yep so you could say my object instance and then you could say my object instance dot some string because that was the attribute. If I want to call a method, I just do this. I just say dot and then whatever the method name was. Um, let's see, from the variables it's stored in. Yep, okay. And then the last thing I wanted to say was that, um, oh, I remember now, sorry, my brain blanked for a second. Methods versus functions. You might have noticed I use a different word for this even though they're kind of similar, like this, is a function whoops all this this is a function but this is a method why the difference well methods are functions that are tied to a specific object like string dot let's not use upper because that's a little confusing because that other thing is upper but string dot like lower for example this is a method but technically lower is like a function because it's it would look kind of like this if you looked at the coding for how strings are done in python it, it's kind of like this essentially so we can see like if i just if i blocked out your vision and like i just kind of blocked your vision so that you could only see this and you couldn't see anything else other than that it's indented but you know other than that if I blocked your vision out and I just sent you this code by itself and I fixed the indent so it's just like on its own, like if it, if it looked like this when I sent it to you, then, and it didn't have self in there, you would not be able to tell that this was from a class other than the fact that it has self in there. Um, so you would say that's a function. But the thing is, since it is from a class, since it is tied to a class, it's actually a method. So that's where the key difference comes from, by the way. They're basically the same thing, it's just that uh, methods are functions that are tied to a class, essentially, is all you have to know about that. Okay, all right. Well, that covers everything. I'm going to end it there. I'm not going to keep rambling on. I'm tired. It's been a long day. <laughs> Sorry, this video is a lot more rambly and all over the place than the midterm video was. I've... It's been a long couple weeks. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, hopefully this helps, though. If, if, if you find this too confusing... Uh, please just use the resource guide and reach out to me for help if you need it. I mean, not during the test, obviously, but, you know, just watch the midterm review video, which goes over a lot of stuff I didn't cover because I've already covered it. And then, you know, just look through the resource guide. So check the description. I'll post both of those links in there. And then, uh, yeah, good luck on the final exam. And I just want to say that I'm happy I got to help all you guys this semester and it's been fun. And 
it's been a hard year for me. I've had a lot of really hard personal stuff that's happened to me this year, and this has been a good distraction in a way for a, a good kind of distraction, like a good reason to be distracted. It's being helping others. I think it, if you take anything away from this class, <laughs> that's not Python related or programming related at all. It would be, you know, if you're ever feeling bad, I mean, definitely address whatever your issues are. Don't just ignore them, but maybe try to help others, you know, just forget about yourself. I think we spend too much time thinking about ourselves. We spend too much time thinking about ourselves and our future and all that. Just help other people, like seriously. I mean, it, it, don't do it for recognition. Don't do it for attention or whatever. Just like, don't do it to make yourself feel better. Just do it to genuinely help someone. Like literally try to find someone who needs help and try to offer them help and just, you know, be genuine, be, be humble. You never know what can happen to you. You know, we all think that we're all on top of the world, but all it takes is one car accident or, or falling off some height or something or some workplace accident or, or it could be you go to the doctor and you find out you have some disease or something like all it takes is one little event like that to change your entire life. And so, you know, please just be humble and remember that, you know, just be grateful for what you have and try to help other people and give back to the community, please. That's all I would say. Just if you're struggling. Anyway, I'm going to end it there. Good luck on the final. Hope you guys have a wonderful night or day or whenever you watch this. Um, but yeah, I'll see you guys later. Bye, guys.